another Sunday and welcome to Afternoon Tea with Docs. I'm Linda, one of uh, an emergency medicine physician here from Sheffield, and I'm here with my lovely co-host, Dr. Erica, a GP from the West Midlands. And we are both lifestyle medicine physicians. It's wonderful to see so many of our recurrent guests. Hello, Mara. Hello, hello Sudhir. Hello, Sian and Bridget. And to see so many new names joining us today. We would love to get to know you all. So do share away. Let us know where you are from. What is your favorite hot or maybe cold cup of tea? And of course, we would love to know what lifestyle changes would you like us to help you with to live your best life. We dedicate each month to covering a different health topic, and July um, is Cancer Month. We are discussing everything we can do to prevent, treat, and reverse different types of lifestyle cancers. And on the last Sunday of every month, we speak to a patient who, sh who shares how they use these principles in practicing uh, to beat their disease. We host afternoon tea with docs every Sunday at five o'clock, um, 5 p.m. UK time, where you can connect with world-renowned lifestyle medicine experts like our guest today, Dr. Shireen Kassam, consultant hematologist and the leading expert of lifestyle medicine movement in the UK. Each afternoon tea event is divided into two parts for those of you who have joined us for the first time. Um, the first hour is a live interview accessible to all on YouTube, Instagram, Facebook, where we debunk misinformation on healthy um, lifestyle practices and aim to share three actionable takeaways with you um, that you can implement in your life right away to start beating modern lifestyle diseases such as heart disease, lifestyle related cancers, diabetes, obesity and many, many more. Um, and the second half of our event is only accessible to those who have joined us here on Zoom. It is, it is a cozy, non-recorded half an hour where you can get to know the Afternoon Tea with Docs community, speak to us and our lifestyle experts about your health goals in a safe and private environment. And if you're ready to implement your health goals, join our free membership on our website to be part of our supportive community to learn and implement evidence-based healthy lifestyle habits to help you achieve your health goals, to live a long and fulfilling life. Dr. Shireen Kassam is a consultant hematologist and honorary senior lecturer at King's College London, with a special interest in the treatment of patients with lymphoma. She's also passionate about promoting plant-based nutrition for prevention and reversal of chronic diseases and for maintaining optimal health after treatment of cancer. During her hematology training, she took time out to undertake a PhD, investigating the role of selenium in sensitizing cancer cells to chemotherapy and showed that supranutritional doses of selenium could enhance the action of chemotherapy in the lab. She has also published a number of peer-reviewed papers in the field of lymphoma. Shireen discovered the power of nutrition for the prevention and treatment of diseases in 2013, and since then she's been following a whole food plant-based diet. She has immersed herself in the science of nutrition and health and completed the Equal certification in plant-based nutrition. In 2019, she also became an international board-certified lifestyle medicine physician. Shireen founded the Plant-Based Health Professionals UK in 2017 in order to bring evidence-based education on plant-based nutrition to the UK. Since then, she has been appointed as visiting professor of plant-based nutrition at Winchester University, where she has developed and facilitates the UK's only university-based CPD accredited course on plant-based nutrition for healthcare professionals. In January this year, Shireen co-founded and launched the UK's first CQC registered online multidisciplinary plant-based lifestyle medicine healthcare service, Plant-Based Health Online. She is also a member of the Research Advisory Committee for the Vegan Society, and her work has been published by The Times, Mirror, Metro, Plant-Based News, and BBC Food. Welcome, Shireen. I think I need a glass of water after that. <laughs> My God, <laughs> sitting here going uh, red, but thank you very much. And thanks for inviting me. You guys are doing such an amazing job. 
Thank you very much for uh, sharing for joining us and also for giving up another hour and a half of your time to educate the public on how to prevent, treat and reverse diseases. Um, we have heard quite a lot about your work, but I think what our audience and maybe your uh, fellow followers like us don't know is uh, a little bit about your background and what inspired you to become a doctor if you can go all the way back there? Oh dear, I feel like I should have prepared this question. I mean, gosh, it seems such a long time ago, doesn't it? At the age of 18. I don't know. I mean, for so long, for up until like my first year at doing A-levels, I was going to do music. I was going to study um, music and I put in the applications to various universities and uh, royal colleges and you know I'm a really passionate piano player and then something's flipped <laughs> I don't know what and um, you know I was already doing biology and chemistry so you know that was fine to, to pursue the career in medicine and you know I guess I you know it's like with most people you feel like you want to to, to do a job where you're able to actively change the path of somebody's life and it felt at the time maybe that um, music was going to stay as a hobby rather than you know be my career as such so um but you know i think i probably found my passion for med medicine during medical school and and um, beyond rather than when i was doing my a levels so um yeah and i found hematology because it brought together everything that's great about medicine it's the pathology side the fact that you can see a patient you know, take their blood test, look at it down the microscope and then go back all the way back to the patient and tell them what's wrong with them. So it sort of combines that clinical and laboratory um, medicine that very few spe specialties do. So I feel um, privileged to do what I do. That's incredible. We, I, I didn't know that you were thinking of doing music before uh, medicine. Um, how inspiring to know that you're a musician on top of everything that you do. Um, and do you still play then piano quite a bit? Yeah, well, quite a bit. I don't know. It's being cried, crowded out by my passion for promoting the plant based message. Um, but yeah, I've got a piano at home and it's lovely to be able to play. Oh, incredible. Um, and you did say that you became a hematology consultant. And um, for how long did you practice um, hematology when uh, when you just like realized that maybe you have to look down the path of nutrition to get more answers. Yeah, so I started my haematology training back in 2004. Um, and then during that time, I also took four years out to do my PhD. So I, I became a consultant in um, 2012. Um, and I soon realized that, you know, a lot of the um, issues that I was seeing in my patients were related to chronic underlying illnesses. Um, although I was seeing them for lymphoma, most of my patients um, still do have um, the common chronic illnesses like cardiovascular disease, type 2 diabetes, hypertension, high cholesterol. And they were not only impairing the, my patient's quality of life, but also hampering the treatments that are available to them and, you know, increasing the toxicities of the treatment that I can deliver. So, um, and yeah, and then later realized that clearly um, outcomes for future health are really impacted by these underlying health conditions. Um, and really, it seemed um, wrong not to be able to talk to patients in an evidence-based way about, you know, how to improve their, their lives and their quality of lives, because everyone asks me, you know, what can I do? What should I eat? You know, should I be exercising? And really, I only had really, you know, short sentences to deliver at the start of my career, you know, yeah, healthy, balanced diet, you know, yeah, everyone should do some exercise. And so I really did feel that I needed to educate myself a bit better. And then it was when I adopted a plant-based diet back in 2013, that really I started to learn about the science. Um, and it took a good four years, really, before I launched plant based health professionals to, until I felt comfortable with my own level of knowledge to be able to then start, you know, preaching, as <laughs> some people call it. <laughs> we'll go back to the uh, plan based um, aspect of things, but we'd love to know actually why selenium? Yeah, that was also just a bit of serendipity, really. I mean, I was interested in looking at, uh, you know, pharmacology in general in terms of treatment options for, for patients with lymphoma. And it 
I happened to apply for a job that was advertised in a good cancer centre and it was their interest that they were taking forward. But, you know, like with all research, it's about sort of learning the principles of research, how to assess data, how to do experiments. So it wasn't necessarily selenium at the time, but that happened to be the first time that I got into learning and, um, you know, interested in nutrition because clearly we know selenium is an essential micronutrient and, um, you know, it has a clear important role to play um, and yeah there seemed to be some good data at the time for cancer prevention but also higher doses for enhancing the impact of our conventional chemotherapy agents um, but it taught me a lot because you know you've obviously had um, uh, in, in a minute um, uh, T Colin Campbell on, on your um, platform and you know he talks about holism and reductionism and really my project was really reductionist and I don't really truly believe that a single micronutrient is going to be the be all and end all of our, our cancer um, therapies but anyway it was it was a learning experience and got me into that sort of research frame frame of mind like everything in medicine or in any uh, specialty we need springboards to go to the next level and learn a little bit more about ourselves as well as, as about the specialty itself and where the road takes us right yeah, absolutely um, and you did mention that you went on a whole food plant-based diet yourself before and what was the initiating thought for you to go on it what inspired you yeah i mean for me it was the animals so i'd been vegetarian since 2001 and it took all the all the way to 2013 to realize that um, eating eggs and dairy was no longer aligned with my own ethics um, and beliefs so i went vegan for the animals but then i had to discover for myself what a healthy plant-based diet would be, um, even though it was, wasn't was a big transition for me, I thought, well, I better understand a bit more. Plus everyone starts asking you questions, don't they, when, when you change your diet and I didn't have the answers. And that just opened up this whole, like, you know, uh, you know, box full of information that I had not come across. Um, and I, I realized I, I was learning most of this from, you know, the amazing US educators and nobody really was talking about it in the healthcare space in the UK at the time. Yes, absolutely. When we go down the rabbit hole of diet, especially when, when we have a background of medical background or healthcare professionals, when we see diseases piling on and on and on in our clinic and uh, in our life for 12 hours a day, um, once we start figuring it out, it becomes like, okay, what more can I learn? What more can I learn? And it just gets deeper and deeper, um, the understanding that how much nutrition has to do with chronic diseases that, that we treat every day. Um, and your transition, uh, personally, was it difficult to actually find uh, the right recipes? Uh, because a lot of our patients uh, do say that it's a difficult journey to learn new style of eating. How did you find it? Yeah, I actually found it um, quite straightforward because obviously my, you know, traditional cultural dishes that I'm brought up, have been brought up on, you know, a lot of um, Indian food, are very adaptable. Um, and I, I enjoyed fruits and vegetables, so I didn't really have a big issue. You know, if I had to choose one food group to eat forever and nothing else, it would definitely be fruit. So, um, like, I, it didn't feel that um, difficult, but I, I do appreciate that um, depending on one's access and uh, to food and healthy food and skills and knowledge that it can be challenging and it's often easy to reach for convenience foods rather than going back to scratch and, and cooking. But the big change for me was that I did start cooking like I was very much a convenience food person as a vegetarian um, and easily reaching for the um, you know quick option of cheese sandwich and you know kind of like omelette for an easy dinner um, and I did suddenly need to to gain some new cooking skills and new recipes yeah. I certainly found it uh, quite difficult because I never really cooked before and our background is uh, European we don't have any spices so it wasn't it was a bit of a challenge but uh, when I looked at your course the 21 day uh, starting course on uh, plantbasedhealthprofessionals.com I found that to be really easy for my patients to refer to so it's 
it's really good. It's easy recipes that you can um, cook up in 20 minutes. So that was really, really, really useful. Thank you for doing that. Oh, well, that's fine. Well, that's really down to Leila Dagan, um, who's one who's our education lead for plant-based health professionals. And we got funding from Veg Fund. And as you say, 21 day plant-based health challenge. Um, we made sure, or Leila made sure that there were a diverse range of recipes from all cultural backgrounds. And, you know, so people can choose the recipes that suit them in a healthy fashion. And today we are here to talk about cancer. And now while we kind of know the answer uh, to how we can prevent uh, and treat and reverse by going onto a whole food plant-based diet, let's dig a little bit deeper into the science. Um, so unfortunately, uh, as Cancer Research UK says, 40% of the cancers are preventable. It's a shocking number, isn't it? It, it really is, um, you know, that four out of 10 globally could be prevented by diet and healthy lifestyle habits. Um, you know, that differs for different cancers. So, you know, for something like bowel cancer, more than 50% of cases are thought to be preventable. And that's one that's really rising in younger people. Um, and something like breast cancer, maybe 25% are preventable. When it comes to the cancers I treat, um, lymphoma, they're not so um, preventable. But um, that's not to say um, having Having, um, you know, a reduced risk of other chronic illnesses won't be beneficial for you at the time of the diagnosis. So, yeah, we can't prevent all of them, but clearly a large proportion of the common cancers are preventable. Mm -hmm. And we often say that uh, genetics are not our destiny here on the show, as Dr. Esselstein and many of the leader states. Um, and if you can dig in a little bit to genetics and epigenetics, um, what, what, why is genetics not our destiny and what is epigenetics? Yeah, so, you know, the, the, the genes we inherit from our mother and father, as you say, are not our destiny. Um, clearly, they play um, an important role in, in many of our characteristics and disease risks, but you're able to change the expression of those genes, um, which is termed, you know, more epigenetics, um, by external factors. So we can control, you know, switch on and switch off um, some genes, um, by the actions we take. So we know, and we've known for quite a while that healthy lifestyle habits um, can switch on cancer suppressing genes and switch off the cancer promoting genes, for example. They also affect um, genes to do with inflammation and you know, cardiovascular disease and, and all sorts. So, so less than 10% of cancers are thought to be caused by genes we inherit from our parents. Um, and the rest is due to a combination of um, lifestyle factors and the changes in the gene expression, um, new mutations that are created by being exposed to, you know, external toxins or risk factors. Um, and of course, you know, a sizable proportion you can't do anything about, um, you know, but uh, it's all about uh, reducing your risk as much as possible. And when we talk about inflammation and oxidative stress, as you mentioned, um, these are the factors that increase our risk of cancer. Um, and also, um, you must mention high cholesterol, unhealthy gut microbiome. And these are the biological pathways where lifestyle and nutrition very much contribute to um, to upregulating or downregulating these processes. Um, can you tell us a little bit more on how this affects um, our whole body um, in, in total and what is inflammation and oxidative, oxidative stress? Yeah, no, it's, it's complicated questions. I think at the end of the day, cancer is, as, as we know, is an unregulated growth of cells. You know, the, growth, the cells develop a growth advantage um, usually because they've acquired a, a, some sort of DNA damage, like a mutation that gives them the advantage of um, growing out of control and then away from their original site um, to other body organs. Now, obviously we're always um, experiencing damage to our DNA and we expect our body's immune system to be able to keep that in check. So a cell that gets damaged gets you know, removed from the body or just stays there dormant, you know, not causing a problem. Um, and, you know, by having um, a healthy diet that keeps um, our immune system in check predominantly to be able to recognize 
these um, uh, abnormal rogue cells is really the key to um, you know, preventing cancer. Um, and as your audience well knows, you know, our immune system essentially starts in our gut. <laughs> you know, 70% of our immune system is driven by the health of our, our gut microbiome. Um, so by um, providing the right nutrients to your gut microbiome, it stimulates the right immune cells, it stimulates the, the cytokines and the um, chemical factors that are important in regulating the immune system. And then that has an effect all the way through um, the body. Um, but then, as you mentioned, the sort of things that can damage cells are oxidative stress, you know, these free radicals that form when you expose cells to things like alcohol or smoking or processed meat. Um, and um, we need antioxidants and anti-inflammatory um, components to dampen down that damage to the DNA. And they could come from um, your food. Um, so, you know, the richest foods um, that have high levels of antioxidants are those dark colored, um, you know, vegetables and fruits um, and herbs and spices, you know, that's the sort of compounds we need to be consuming to keep that um, DNA damage, oxidative stress, etc. In, in check. And same with, you know, physical activity and sleep and, you know, stress relieving activities, they all act to dampen down that oxidative stress inflammation that then help to keep the immune system in check and therefore your immune system can keep um, those rogue cells, either eliminate them or just keep them dormant. Um, there was a quite a large study um, that was circulating in 2018, impact of healthy lifestyle factors on life expectancies in the US population, I think with 170,000 men and women that found that certain lifestyle factors can reduce the risk of dying from cancer by up to 65%. Uh, can you tell us a little bit more about this study and what we have learned? Yeah, so I guess what much of what we know about diet and health and health outcomes come from following um, healthy people for, um, you know, several years um, and um, checking out what they are doing in their lives, like what they're eating, their healthy lifestyle habits, and then seeing which illnesses that they develop or don't do. Um, develop. And this study you're referring to is an analysis from the Nurses Health Study and the Health Professionals Follow-Up Study from um, the US, where um, health professionals essentially have been followed um, since the 1970s, so over, over 30 years. Um, and um, there's correlations and associations been made between healthy lifestyle habits and their disease outcomes. And this one looked at five healthy lifestyle factors. So a healthy diet, um, which included high intakes of fruits and vegetables, um, nuts, seeds, legumes, and low intakes or, or no intake of red and processed meat, low intake of processed foods in general, low levels of sugar and salt intake. And also then, you know, regular physical activity, um, moderate rather than excessive alcohol, alcohol use um, and healthy body weight um, and whether they smoked or not. Um, and together, as you say, if people had the healthiest um, uh, five lifestyle factors, they reduced their risk of dying over that 30 year period from cancer by 35%. Um, but just having a healthy diet, if all you did was a healthy diet, that also reduced your risk of dying from cancer by about um, 30%. So obviously it's an additional, um, you know, um, cumulative um, advantage you're giving yourself with each healthy lifestyle factor. And, the, you know, people say, you know, of course, you could have to die of something. And that's absolutely true. And um, but the the thing is, I think we forget that now in, in the UK, we spend on average 12 years of our life in ill health. So although, you know, life expectancy is over the age of 80 for women, 12 years are spent in ill health and none of us want that. And this study showed that those extra years that you're living are definitely in better health. Wow, 30% um, decrease just by changing your diet. That's a huge number and something that's so accessible, both economically as well as uh, physically to change for all of us if we know how. Um, and as, as you mentioned, yes, uh, uh, we all have to die somehow. And I hear this from my patients all the time. And as Dean Ornish says in a room, uh, there's 100% death rates because unfortunately all of us will die. 
but the big question here is how. Uh, and certainly what we see um, in all of our specialties now, even in A&E, um, patients are coming in repeatedly with chronic diseases um, and a really poor quality of life, which is what I think all of us are trying to get the message out, that you don't have to live like that. You can um, you know, have a good quality uh, life where you're jogging with your uh, great-grandchildren at age 90 and die young um, at age hun over 100. Um, so certainly a strong message to give out and uh, that everybody has the power to change their lives. Um, a little bit about fiber, which is something I think very important and something that helped with microlitis treatment. Um, I would love to ask you, there was this, um, according to the Cancer Research UK, the lack of fiber causes about 30% of cases of bowel cancer, which is more than double the cases caused by red and processed meat consumption. Can you tell us more about the importance of fiber in cancer development uh, and also treatment? Yeah, well, no, interesting question. And fiber is key to, to keeping healthy from every chronic illness, really. So cancer is not unique there. Um, but with regards to colorectal cancer, um, which is one of our common ones, you know, fiber really is the only food that's um, required and necessary for the gut microbiome. So, you know, it doesn't get digested, it goes down to the large bowel and it there um, gets utilized by um, the, the gut microbiome, which is key. Um, so having a diverse gut microbiome with healthy gut bacteria and keeping suppressed the unhealthy bacteria is key to keeping the gut healthy. And, um, and those bacteria that we want will produce short chain fatty acids, these chemicals that are the transmitters that sort of communicate between different organs um, and the, the gut cells themselves. Um, so that's where the link is that it's really keeping the gut lining healthy um, and um, um, creating a microbiome that also promotes a healthy immune system. But of course, ha um, having enough fiber in the diet, you know, keeps your um, the rest of the gut um, contents moving. It stops you being constipated. It keeps a nice um, bowel movement. And within that bowel movement, you're excreting um, toxins and um, nutrients and things that we don't want. So, you know, for example, estrogen will be excreted through having enough fiber and so will cholesterol. So, you know, um, all those, those, those factors are not directly um, impacting cancer per se um, in, in, in colorectal cancer. It will do in certain hormones driven cancers, you know, when you want to regulate your estrogen levels for breast cancer, endometrial cancer, for example, you know, having enough fiber and excreting the excess estrogen is really important. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Um, and many patients do ask, a um, bit off topic, but before we go on, can you just tell us the difference between a vegan diet and a whole food plant-based diet? From an expert like you, I must ask this. Well, I don't know if I'm an expert, but you know, the term vegan is, um, is best used to describe you know, the whole vegan philosophy, which is about um, social justice and justice for the animals. So um, you know, if you're eating a vegan diet, we know what you're not eating. So you're not consuming animal flesh or any products made from the use of animals. Um, but that doesn't tell me what you're eating. And you know full well that somebody on a vegan diet could be eating fruits and vegetables, or they could be eating Pringles and Oreos and drinking Diet Coke, for example. So um, for me, a vegan diet doesn't tell you what you're eating. It's really what you're not eating. Um, whereas if somebody describes their diet as a whole food plant-based diet, that to me is a healthy vegan diet composed of fruits, vegetables, whole grains, beans in pretty much equal proportions. And then, you know, um, a regular um, a portion, small portion, 30 grams a day, uh, approximately of, of nuts and seeds, uh, as well as a really healthy addition. Thank you very much for clearing that up for all of us. <laughs> uh, it is definitely a question that comes up regularly. Um, and um, when we talk about um, the microbiome um, and fiber. Um, I would just like to ask you a little bit about dairy and how does it uh, play in? Because we talk about meat a lot, but when it comes to dairy, uh, it's a little bit more of a middle ground of understanding of what is it really? 
Um, so, so I mean, well, dairy is, is is foods that we consume are predominantly, obviously, made from the milk of, of pregnant cows. Um, and you know, it's a it's a difficult topic to tease out when you read the literature because, you know, in the words of David Katz, who we all admire, it's always a question of compared to what or instead of what. So, you know, I don't think we can um, demonize dairy as good or bad. It's just that. I talk about making better choices. Um, there is no requirement for humans to drink the milk or consume the products made of the milk of another animal. And 70% of the world's population, pe particularly people of color, um, have lactose malabsorption. So for 70% of us, it's just completely irrelevant. Yes, in European countries, we've got used to having that as part of our diet, and it's expected that it's part of, a, you know, a healthy, balanced diet. But, you know, when you look into the history of that, it's purely a, a, a result of really exceptionally good marketing rather than it being an actual health food. So, you know, with all things, you have to decide, are you making the best choice for you and your health? And the answer to dairy is, is no, there's no necessity for it in the diet, and you can make a better choice. Um, and I always compare it to swapping out dairy to, to choosing um, soya foods and soya milk, for example, because we have those studies. We know, for example, from the Adventist Health Study, um, that um, when they analysed what women were drinking, whether it was soya milk or dairy milk, they showed that those drinking the most dairy milk had about a 50% increased risk of developing breast cancer and in a dose dependent way, which makes you think that it's real, you know, everything in medicine happens in a dose response, you know, the more you have the the, the worse or the better the, the, the outcome if it's a genuine association. Um, whereas in contrast, if people were consuming soya milk and ditching the um, dairy, they significantly reduced their risk of breast cancer by about 30% in, in this rather long follow up of over 20 years of these um, participants. So, you know, and we know that if you start consuming soya foods and, and milk um, in adolescence, you reduce your future risk of developing um, cancer. And that kind of makes sense when it comes to hormone driven cancers, because dairy is a high source of um, female hormones, both estrogen and progesterone, for obvious reasons, you know, pregnant cow um, and lactating cow is obviously going to have ha high levels of estrogen. And we don't really need to have exogenous estrogen, our bodies are perfectly capable of making enough. And taking more of something is not necessarily a good thing. Um, whereas soya foods and soya milk, for example, is really quite clever in the body, it sort of down regulates um, the impacts of excessive estrogen. Um, whereas in the bone, it protects your bone from, um, you know, um, falling levels of, of estrogen as we age. Um, and it's heart healthy, it's, um, it's got some fiber, it's unsaturated fats, um, and it can be a great source of calcium too, when it's calcium set tofu, for example, or fortified um, drink. So I've kind of not answered your question, but I think it always comes down to like, we, we should be making better choices, not just the the kind of easy, uh, comfortable ones that we've been used to making. And when it comes to cancer prevention and survival after cancer, we should be optimizing our, our foods um, that we choose. Uh, certainly. Thank you for answering that um, and for touching on soy as well. Um, it is a personal question to me because it's um, it really fueled my own colitis. And we know very well there is a clear link between chronic inflammation and cancer. And um, I certainly suffered uh, due to particularly dairy. Uh, and as soon as I have removed that in every form, I've seen a huge difference in my colitis and was able to get off of my medication. So um, having the this honest, straight conversation about it um, really helps rather than just going around it and uh, not really, um, really facing the questions that we should um, face as humans, not only as you said, the easy one. So thanks for clarifying that. Um, and um, you just talked about soya um, and you touched on um, the estrogen in dairy products. Um, and um, lots of people do ask, you know, doesn't soya contain estrogen? Can it be harmful? Um, and especially some of, you know, my male relatives do ask, you know, is it safe for me to consume soya? Yeah, and it's a common question, and I think there's a lot of myths 
Um, but the science is absolutely clear, you know, that for everyone, assuming you're not the less than 1% of people who are allergic to soya protein, then soya really is a, a great addition to your diet, regardless of your if you're plant based or, or not. Um, yeah, it contains plant estrogens which have a similar structure to human estrogens but they act very differently and as i say they're quite clever molecules that act in the right way in the right tissue so in the breast they downregulate estrogen um, and in the bone they can enhance the impact of estrogen and you know for postmenopausal women or around the menopause perimenopause they're known it, soya foods uh, and milk is known to um, dampen down the effects of you know hot flashes and things like that so it's a really clever um, uh, food to have in the diet and those phytoestrogens um, are also found in flax seeds you know the lignans and they're really really useful um, compounds to be consuming when they come from plant foods um, and I think we think you know this comes back to the reductionist um, approach doesn't it when we look at people who are consuming soya regularly they have great health outcomes you shouldn't really have to dissect it down into the individual components and then um, you know experiment with those individual components and any of those myths that still persist have been fueled purely by animal studies um, and um, the occasion when some people have been consuming huge amounts, like, you know, three litres a day of soya milk. Um, but, you know, if anyone wants to learn and read about soya, Mark Messina is the man. Um, he spent his life um, talking and writing and researching on soya. And there's definitive papers now showing absolutely no impact on male hormonal health, in fact, you know, no detrimental impact, whereas it does have a benefit for reducing um, the risk of prostate cancer. And same for women, you know, promotes brain health, reduces the risk of um, female um, derived cancers. Um. Uh, thank you for clarifying that. Uh, and hopefully it's clarified that for, for lots of people and the confusion around soya. <clears throat> and talking about dairy as well, I just want to touch on insulin like growth factor. Um, and um, there, there is a group of people with uh, Laron syndrome, which is um, a, a rare form of dwarfism, and they are deficient in insulin like growth factor one. Um, and they virtually don't suffer with uh, cancer and um, conditions like diabetes. Can you kind of uh, talk, talk a little bit about why that might be? Yeah, so, um, you know, as as um, the name suggests, insulin like growth factor is a growth factor, it makes cells grow, it's kind of what makes us reach our growth potential. Um, and we need it as children and adolescents to, to grow in height. Um, but beyond kind of our, our peak um, height um, being achieved, we don't need bucket full of insulin like growth factor. And we know that our diet and lifestyle choices can impact that level of insulin like growth factor in the body. Um, and we've known for quite a few years actually um, that people who have higher levels of insulin like growth factor in their blood, when they're followed over time, they're more likely to develop cancer. Now, you know, that's just an association, it doesn't prove cause and effect, but um, there is good sort of experimental um, uh, data supporting that, as I say, the population data. And then, as you say, people who have really low levels virtually never develop um, cancer. So it kind of makes sense. And, and really the strongest evidence for insulin like growth factor being implicated, especially with dairy consumption is with prostate cancer, because those men consuming the most dairy products um, around 400 grams a day of dairy have about a 30% increased risk of developing prostate cancer. And certainly one of the mechanisms proposed is that, um, you know, dairy increases your own body's uh, level of insulin like growth factor because you're consuming that from um, the, the cow's um, insulin like growth factor. But the other thing to say is that we know and have known for a while that animal protein directly increases the level of insulin like growth factor in our bodies as well. Um, and the really great news about this is that there's been experiments done on people changing their diet and lifestyle, you know, adding in a bit of exercise, getting rid of dairy and Uh, sorry, sorry. Was a study that lasted just about 12 days looking at a change of diet to plant based and adding in exercise and you can really um, greatly reduce your um, risk 
uh, sorry, your level of insulin like growth factor. And we know that vegans and those on a plant based diet have the lowest levels of insulin like growth factor. So it sort of makes sense. And we know that those people following a plant based diet and vegans have a lower risk of developing cancer data shows us. So it kind of all adds up. Um, and, and really, as adults, it's a good idea to keep your insulin like growth factor levels low. Okay, so we've kind of talked about the uh, plant based um, nutrition and how that might help um, in terms of cancer prevention uh, and improve, uh, perhaps improve outcome um, with a cancer diagnosis as well. But lots of people might think about the genetic component if they're genetically predisposed um, to developing cancer um, that, you know, uh, like um, Linda mentioned earlier that genetics is, is not our destiny and we, we know that. Um, and how much, how many um, percentage of cancers are attributable to, to their genetic risk? No. Oh, le well, less than 10%. But there again, it does depend on an individual basis. There, there are clearly mm. some cancer genes that really vastly increase your risk of cancer so much so that you might be invited to have um, screening or even, um, you know, preventative treatments and surgeries. You know, we're all familiar with hearing about the BRCA1, BRCA2 genes, which vastly increase the risk of female cancers, but also colorectal cancer and certain women choosing to have their breasts and ovaries removed. Um, and, you know, that's a very unique situation and even less than 10% of breast cancers are caused by mm. uh, BRCA genes. But when you have that particular gene, then it really does sort of um, in increase your risk considerably. But for most of us who haven't inherited a single sort of cancer gene, then yeah, our genetic inheritance really does only contribute to five to 10% of our overall risk uh, of cancer. And as I say, you can mitigate that risk. So there's been some quite good um, uh, data from the UK Biobank um, study, which um, recruited about half a million men and women. Um, and they've looked at both breast cancer and colorectal cancer. Or certainly I've seen those study results um, showing that, you know, people with the healthiest lifestyle can even reduce their risk of cancer, even if they've inherited certain single nucleotide polymorphism so certain um, alterations in their DNA that predispose them a bit more to cancer than somebody without those um, SNPs as we call them so it you know there, there is no reason why we shouldn't be adopting these healthy lifestyle habits um, for cancer prevention. And, and Dr. Dean Ornish has also shown that, you know, within within 12 weeks in his study um, participants that, you know, more than 500 um, genes can be switched on and off simply by changing our lifestyle. Yeah. So that's I mean, just incredible. Yeah. His studies are seminal, aren't they? You know, to think yeah. that you can bring down your prostate specific antigen level and reduce the growth of prostate cancer cells um, is it, just remarkable when it's just through a lifestyle kind of approach. Mm. Um, we talked earlier about your, uh, your study in selenium um, and you know, lots of people ask about food supplementations um, and um, we actually know that they're not always beneficial and can sometimes be harmful. Can you kind of speak to that a bit more? Yeah, so, I mean, I think we've got a long history of knowing that you can't take out the nutrient in a food, put it in a pill, um, you know, have it at high levels and expect it to suddenly transform your health. And um, we also know that cer certain <clears throat> high doses of, of supplements like beta carotene, for example, and people who smoke increases the risk of um, lung cancer. Even while I was doing my PhD, there was a big study going on in people um, in men who were trying to prevent prostate cancer and being given selenium supplements. And what they showed was not only did um, the selenium supplements not prevent um, cancer or prostate cancer, but increase the risk slightly of type two diabetes. So, you know, we don't understand enough about these individual micronutrients and we have to appreciate they, they work together with all the other nutrients in the food in ways that we're never going to understand, to be honest, um, that really you can't take the individual nutrient out. And sometimes we can do harm by overdoing um, nutrients. And I'm particularly cautious during cancer treatments <clears throat> because, 
you know, a, a lot of our cancer treatments actually work by um, creating oxidative stress and damaging DNA in order to damage the DNA of cancer cells and ultimately make them die. And if you're then piling on a load of antioxidants to kind of downplay that oxidative stress, then you can hypothesize that you might be um, uh, interacting with the effects of chemotherapy and that you know there's certain things like for example one of our myeloma treatments you shouldn't shouldn't be consuming um green tea there's you know some of our cll treatments um interact with, with um you know seville there are really these nuances that really you need to take um um, advice from somebody who's appropriately qualified. And we really rely on our pharmacists to let, let us know about the in, interactions between food supplements, um, uh, you know, high doses of micronutrients and um, cancer treatments per se. And when it comes to cancer prevention, the World Cancer Research Fund is clear that the cancer, um, you know, supplements shouldn't be used to prevent cancer. Um, we should be getting our nutrients from food. Obviously, there's times when you do need to take supplements. And on a whole food plant-based diet, we recommend a B12 supplement for everyone, vitamin D if you're not getting enough um, sunshine. And obviously, you need to know where you're getting your iodine from. And if you're not getting it in food sources, then you might choose to have it in a supplement form. So, you know, there are nuances, but mostly um, we should be getting our, our micronutrients from food. You, you mentioned about being on cancer treatment and taking um, antioxidant supplementation. Um, what about um, a plant-based diet that is full of natural antioxidants? Is that safe to do? Yeah, I know. Absolutely. There's never been any harm shown from that. And, um, you know, although there haven't been um, any studies of a purely whole food plant based diet with cancer treatment, I'd love to see that happen, but it's never going to, is it? Um, you know, nobody's going to back such a study because there's no money to be made out of it. What we do know is that from the Women's Health Initiative study, for example, which is one of the most expensive, largest, longest kind of nutrition intervention studies ever performed is that um, people who were eating um, a, a lower fat, um, healthier diet, which was um, a higher in vegetables, whole grains um, and um, fruits, they had a better survival from breast cancer if they developed breast cancer. So, you know, that was one of the first times that we've learned that, you know, a healthier diet full of more plant foods can actually impact how you do after a diagnosis of breast cancer. And we've got similar studies looking at colorectal cancer and quality of diet and showing those eating the most plant foods before the diagnosis and after the diagnosis had a better um, survival and longer remission. So, you know, it's all pointing in the same direction, um, you know, which is why the guidelines also say, you know, have a diet full of whole plant foods um, before, during and after your diagnosis of cancer, if you're unlucky enough to have that diagnosis. Um, and OK, so um, we've we've heard a lot about but from from you, I feel I'm talking to an encyclopedia here. <laughs> um, and if what can I do actively to prevent or lower uh, my risk of getting cancer uh, if you have to give me some practical tips yeah well as you say i mean it's great because it's the same practical tips for every um guest speaker you've had isn't it really because um these healthy lifestyle habits are key for preventing cardiovascular disease type 2 diabetes mm. keeping a healthy weight you know preventing dementia etc so they they are no different you know i think um when it comes to food you know i would say fill up on fiber rich plant foods um having a variety i think variety is key rather than getting bogged down with individual foods um so eat the colors of the rainbow and make that the, the the feature of your plate and if you're having some meat and dairy or eggs then it really needs to be the condiment you just need to switch it around you know piling up the fruits and vegetables and the whole grains and the beans because they're the only ones that have been associated with reduced risk of chronic illness um, regular exercise, you know, everything we've said about diet, you can translate to exercise, it reduces oxidative stress, it changes gene expression, it lengthens your telomeres, it reduces insulin resistance, you know, reduces inflammation, it go, you can go on and on, it's all the same things. 
I think restorative sleep so important <clears throat> because it reduces the risk of every single chronic illness. Um, and what we haven't touched upon is that, you know, obviously having underlying chronic illnesses like cardiovascular disease, type 2 diabetes, kidney problems also increase your risk of developing cancer. So it sort of all ties in. Um, and then, yeah, avoiding, you know, cancer causing toxins. Um, such as alcohol and tobacco, I think we're quite familiar with. Um, and yeah, being mindful and keeping stress levels um, at, at um, acceptable levels also um, keep our hormones um, and stress hormones in, in check, which is important in um, being able to um, have healthy cells that don't develop um, cancer related properties. Great. So following the principles of lifestyle medicine, I can greatly reduce my risk of getting cancer. That's good to know. Um, what about people who have been um, diagnosed with cancer? Um, I know you, you probably often get asked, you know, what can I do? Is this everything now in the doctor's hands or can I do something about it? No, I mean, we, we now know for the really common cancers like breast, colorectal and prostate cancer, that um, healthy lifestyle habits during and after the diagnosis really can improve your chances of remission and reduce your chances of dying. Um, and this is also in the guidelines from um, the American College of something or other exercise and something where they've clearly laid out um, the statistics that are involved with um, adopting, you know, regular physical activity. Um, and you can reduce your chance of dying from cancer by around 30%, even if you've had cancer, you know, so it's really remarkable statistics. Um, and um, I think part of that is because you're reducing your risk of other chronic illnesses and partly because you're enhancing your immune system and keeping those rogue cancer cells that still may be um, apparent and, and left in your body, you know, you prevent them from developing those growth advantage and, and, and uh, uh, sort of growing again. So yeah, really, really important. So I think for diet and exercise, we've got really good um, data now for mm. cancer survivors. I think I haven't seen really big studies on sleep and, uh, you know, um, uh, healthy relationships and positive psychology, but, you know, it's really going to enhance our quality of life anyway. So there's no downside to all the other pillars of lifestyle medicine. And in, in your, in your clinic, looking after lymphoma patients, what sort of advice would you give them um, what, during treatment, um, other than what you have already mentioned, and maybe why do you give those advice? Yeah, well, I think, you know, advice during cancer treatments really needs to be individualized, and you really need to take into account uh, a person's um, social, financial, um, you know, um, uh, the emotional um, state um, before dishing out um, all this advice, which can appear to be preachy. So really, you have to get to know where your patients are, you know, what they understand by healthy lifestyle habits, what they're doing already. And then, you know, in, in the teachings of lifestyle medicine, try and develop a kind of lifestyle prescription that's unique for that patient. But having said that, they often need very expert um, advice as well, because some of the treatments that I have to deliver really are very intensive and, you know, people are, are finding it difficult with appetite and nausea and fatigue and all those things that really hamper our ability to sort of cook and eat and, you know, um, prioritise our healthy lifestyle habits. So <clears throat> we really rely on our cancer dietitians and our physiotherapists to really guide our patients through these really kind of intensive um, treatment. So it really does come down to being individualized and relying on our um, allied health professionals, which is crucial, you know, working in the cancer field really is a team effort. Um, and, you know, I probably have one of the easiest jobs, which is like, you know, telling somebody the diagnosis and prescribing the chemotherapy, it's our nurses and mm. physios and dietitians that actually make sure they get through treatment um, and and do it as well as they can. Um, and then I get to see them back afterwards where I can reiterate some of those healthy lifestyle habits and, and try and um, support them to get that more embedded in their everyday lives. And because because actually, you know, may, um, making sure that they're living as healthfully as possible doesn't, even if it doesn't improve the you know get the cancer itself it's optimizing that overall health is still really important because that can impact on actually what cancer treatment they might be able to have isn't that is That's that right. true 
Yeah, so yeah. to come and see me without type 2 diabetes and heart disease and atrial fibrillation and hypertension and all those things that you guys see every day makes my life a lot easier and makes the patient's ability to tolerate treatments so much easier. And then, unfortunately, we know that cancer treatments have side effects and we worry a lot about long term side effects and even these newer you know targeted fancy expensive medicines we're realizing increase your risk of heart disease atrial fibrillation hypertension fatty liver you know all these things that are, are then exacerbated if we're not paying attention to diet and lifestyle um, and that's been shown again in in robust studies um, so you know for my, part of my job is really counseling patients to try and minimize their risk of the long-term side effects of cancer treatments and they're predominantly cardiovascular related and also second cancers so that's also been highlighted recently in some big studies you know showing that once you've had one cancer your risk increase and often the same risk factors are playing a part in that second cancer so really we have to be um, mindful of our support we're giving patients for after the cancer diagnosis as well and it can also um, can it also impact on the uh, individual's response to the cancer treatment yeah there's a little bit of data on that so you know for example um in one of the hematological cancers that we see a lot of myeloma, um, we know it's related to um, being uh, increased your risk of myeloma if you're overweight or obese. And also um, there is worse outcomes if you have high blood sugars. So people with um, poorly controlled diabetes or diabetes per se, you know, respond less well um, to, um, to, to the myeloma treatments. Um, and also you probably know from your own experience that hematologists love to use bucket full of steroids. And the one thing steroids highlights and worsens is your diabetes or your mm -hmm. insulin resistance or your pre-diabetic state. And that really, really causes us a big headache. So, you know, those complications of, of getting um, steroid induced diabetes is, 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 is a real challenge for us to manage. Wow. So, I mean, although cancer as a topic could be quite a heavy topic, I think what, what I've heard today, it's really empowering that there is actually a lot we can do before and even after a diagnosis of cancer. So that is really, really good news. And I wondered before we conclude, if, if you have any particular sort of success stories or cases that's made um, a particular impression on you that you'd like to share with us? Um, yeah, well, I mean, it was, it, it sort of, um, it was a patient that really kind of um, started my, um, or gave me confidence to really come out and um, start speaking about the impact in diet and, and lifestyle, you know, I didn't really think that he would be the type that was going to go all the way, but he and his wife after his um, second diagnosis of lymphoma and had got back into remission were clearly de determined to to um, make um, a lifestyle change um, the weight. They um, uh, had um, hypertension um, and, you know, they wanted to improve their own um, quality of, of life. And, you know, like I do, I give people book recommendations, but I don't really believe that anyone takes me up on those, but they read um, a book that I really, um, found quite useful for myself, which was Eat to Live by Joel Furman. And they they did a 360 and uh, completely changed around their diet, went fully plant-based, lots of loads of weight, started physical activity, you know, came off um, their hypertension medicines. And it really did um, highlight the power of, of, of these lifestyle interventions, but also the importance of, you know, having a partner that supports you. Um, he actually had been a chef in a former life, so he already had the kind of skills and knowledge to know how to make tasty food. Um, and yeah, and having that motivation that comes from a, a diagnosis, a, a sort of critical diagnosis, um, was enough to spearhead them. So that kind of brought me out of my shell and as it were to start really talking more openly about this outside of the um, uh, you know, clinic room. Um, because I, I think some a lot of work that still needs to be done about getting the message out there. I don't think the science is going to change anytime soon. We don't need more research. We need to get this implemented in the forefront of people's minds and support patients, clients, you know, general public 
to be able to access um, these healthy lifestyle habits, whether it's through buying, you know, cheaper food, green spaces, you know, um, all those sort of things. Oh, we have covered a lot and uh, we have quite a lot of questions actually on Facebook and on YouTube live as well. Um, but before we move on to those questions, um, we here on Afternoon TV Docs, we like to summarize um, what we have learned uh, into three practical uh, takeaways that they can implement right away to take control of their health. Would you be able to just give us a quick summary uh, that they can implement right away? Oh gosh, that's tough, isn't it? Well, I might. So um, I think I'll stick with food because it really is um, my um, number one passion. Um, I think when it comes to food for cancer prevention, I don't like talking about individual foods, but there's, there already are some standout foods. So I would say add in um, uh, soya foods. Um, whether it's tofu, tempeh, soya milk, you know, minimally processed. Um, so swapping out your dairy, adding in the soya foods will make an immense um, difference to cancer plus cardiovascular risk. Um, I think as much as I don't really like them, mushrooms has got to be a feature of every plant-based diet. I have to force myself to eat them. But like when you look at the, the evidence, you know, having mushrooms is really, really, really important. And your audience will already know cruciferous vegetables, probably the star of all cancer preventing um, protocols. So I think I'll go for that soya, mushrooms and, um, you know, uh, broccoli, cabbage, that's family of, uh, of vegetables. Um, if you bring those into your um, everyday um, diet, you'll be doing yourself a, a whole lot of good. <laughs> oh, I didn't know that you didn't like mushroom, Shireen. <laughs> <laughs> Oh, I'm lucky. I do adore mushrooms and I can eat them in large quantities. <laughs> uh, well, how amazing. And uh, it was lovely to learn a little bit more about you as well. And uh, we would love to thank you for these incredible practical takeaways and for all the knowledge and all the work that you do. You give us so generously with your time and your knowledge to inspire a generation of doctors and patients to learn to um, to eat and to practice uh, lifestyle medicine um, for for all of us. So we, we would like to thank you, Shireen, for taking the time out for, uh, this Sunday evening today to share with us uh, the lifestyle and nutrition science that can save many lives. We are really grateful for all that you do, and we are looking forward to learning more about your future projects. Um, to those who would like to connect with Dr. Shireen Kassam and her incredible work and team, uh, you can uh, check out the comments uh, here on the chat, or if you're watching us on YouTube, it will be on the description. Um, the two websites that you can uh, have a look at is help uh, um, plantbasedhealthprofessionals.com, plantbasedhealthonline.com, and you can connect with her also on Instagram. And if you would like to learn more about the best and most affordable nutrition science course for healthcare professionals and as well as uh, uh, non-healthcare professionals, if you're very interested in nutrition that supports chronic disease reversal, make sure you uh, check out the six-week uh, Winchester University course. Uh, Plant-based nutrition, a sustainable diet for optimal health, which is um, ran and moderated by Dr. Shireen uh, herself. Um, and the link uh, for the website is as well under the comments here below. I uh, highly recommend it for everyone who wants to take control of their health. Uh, next Saturday, we have Professor Robert Thomas join us to talk about keeping healthy after cancer. Do stay connected with us on social media and say hello on Instagram and subscribe to our YouTube channel and the links are below. We really appreciate all your support as we do this on our free time free of charge. So any shares uh, are greatly appreciated to help our patients and our loved ones keep healthy. And um, you can um, join our free um, membership area on our website, afternoontwithdots.com. 
um, to continue um, any sort of health um, topic, um, health related conversations, um, share tips and challenges um, and um, join this supportive community to help you implement the healthful lifestyle changes you want that will enable you to live a long and fulfilling life. Please do let us know how we're doing in the chat or um, in, in the comment on YouTube, Facebook. Um, we really do appreciate your feedback. Um, and for those listening on live stream, thank you for listening and have a lovely evening. Thank you. Uh, bye guys, now we go off, uh, off of recording and we will take a few